So Mark 20, Mark 24, there's no Mark 24, Mark 7, verses 24 through 30, uh, reads as follows. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, he could not escape, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Seraphonician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord is already blessed, may be blessed by the hearing and reading of God's word on today. We are going to be talking about the kind of faith that saves. Uh, the kind of faith that saves. The kind of faith that saves. Um, and the main idea I hope to bring out of the uh, text today is that in healing the Seraphonician's daughter, Jesus shows the gospel uh, is for the Jew first and then to the nations. In her approach and response to Christ, the mother demonstrates the kind of faith that saves. So. Again, in healing the Seraphonician's daughter, Jesus shows the gospel is for the Jews first and then to the nations. And in her approach and response to Christ, the mother demonstrates the kind of faith that saves. Um, now, this is, this is an interesting passage, and I, as I'll, I'll dive into that as we sort of go into it. It's... It's interesting for a couple of things. Number one, it's Jesus, as in our studies of the Gospel of Mark, this is only the second time that Jesus has gone into Gentile territory. Um, this, specifically, he goes into the area that on our modern maps would be uh, the country of Lebanon. Um, the first time he went into a Gentile area was back in Mark chapter 5, and that's when he healed the Gerasene demoniac, the, the man who had the thousands of demons in it. You know, we, we talked about how he was lord of the supernatural realm. Um, and it's interesting in this passage because, not last week, two weeks ago now, we looked at uh, the issue of clean versus unclean foods. And we talked about uh, the folly of legalism and you know, how it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles because that goes through the belly and then it's expelled, uh, but that which comes from the heart, so inward out. Uh, and so we're, we're dealing with that issue with unclean foods. By, by the way, we also had the sort of the hypocritical Pharisees. So you had these individuals that, as Christ was saying, had set aside 
the commands of God for the tradition of the elders. And so uh, from that, we move from that issue dealing with clean and unclean foods, where, and now moving into an issue where Jesus goes into an area that for many Jews, they would consider it to be unclean because an unclean people dealt there. And you know, from, from their perspective, all Gentiles were by their definition unclean. And uh, that's interesting because it's something that we're gonna see repeated. Well, we won't see it repeated in Mark, but if you read the book of Acts, it's actually repeated. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, just, just for your reference in Acts chapter 10, where we have the story of Peter, where he goes to see Cornelius, the uh, centurion. Uh, that starts out with Peter having a dream related to unclean foods. Or foods that even at that time, you know, he, he says, Lord, I'm, my mouth has never touched anything un unclean. And you have that whole vision uh, where there's the thrice full vision. And then after that, the Lord sends people, Gentiles, uh, to get to Peter to bring them to uh, himself, why? So that they can hear the gospel also. You know that that's a, sort of a duplication of what they're uh, of what we're seeing here. And as I said in the main idea, it, it, it's Jesus here was showing us what he's going to be showing us that yes, while he came for the household of Israel first, while the gospel was going to the Jew first, it wasn't just going to stay among the Jewish uh, people. It was going to spread out. Uh, and of course, we, we see that explicitly in the Great Commission in Matthew where he, you know, he says, oh, go ye therefore into all lands, to, to all nations. Uh, and in Acts, Acts 1.8, we also see that where he says, you're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. You know that, uh, and, and given that command, Christ was just saying, you all are basically going to put into action what I did in baby steps while I uh, walked the earth. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's what we're uh, seeing here, that that groundwork for really the, go the global gospel is being laid here. And that would be important because remember Mark's original readers if you remember from the introduction, what if these would have been sort of Roman Gentiles. That these would have been people in in Rome. So they're 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 by definition they were outside of Israel. They were outside of the original covenant of Israel. Uh, so Jesus goes into this area. It, it, it talks about in verse twenty four this region of Tyre, and Tyre is an area. T y r e is an area that's mentioned a few times in the Old Testament, and none of which is positive. Yeah, so it, it, it's, I hear that whining too. Um, Tyre, in fact, was a godless city. Um, the Jewish historian, the historian Josephus, you know, he describes Tyre, or the people from Tyre, as our bitterest enemies. He's, so he's talking about the relationship between Jews and the, the people that lived in that area. It, it's interesting though that people from Tyre had already come to see Christ. It, in Mark 3, 8, where uh, it, it talks about people coming from all over the lands, including this place, uh, to see Christ. And so that, that explains why he was unable to uh, just quietly or sort of nonchalantly uh, be in the area because his fame had, had already been uh, spreading. Uh, Additionally, although both David and Solomon had trade alliances with the king of Tyre, uh, the two cities came to symbolize idolatry and paganism. King Ahab of Israel married the Sidonian princess Jezebel, who promoted Baal worship in Israel. So she comes from this area. Uh, so. You know, this didn't have a, a positive history. And indeed, if you look at the prophets, so it, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Amos and, and, and Zechariah, they all pronounce judgments against Tyre. In uh, one of the apocryphal books, so those uh, uninspired books as they're, as they're called, um, 
they, they say this in one of those books, First Maccabees, it says, they say that the people of the uh, Ptolemies and Tyre and Sidon and all Galilee of the Gentiles had gathered together against them to annihilate us. And, and so this, there was a bunch of hostility there. And I'm saying all of this to sort of set up why it was so significant that Christ sort of went here. Um, yet at the same time, there probably were Jews in this area. Uh, and in fact, Josephus, the Jewish historian, is going to tell us in about 30 years from the time, actually around the same time that Mark would have been written or being circulating that, you know, people in Tyre were in prison, Jews in Tyre were in prison, so some were put to death, so the relationship here was not good. So, because as, as you're reading this, and, and I'm laying this groundwork because you got to ask yourself, why, why this area? Why is this prophet of you know, he's not just a prophet of Israel, but from the people, from the standpoint of the people living at that time, this man who's claiming to be the Messiah, this man who's claiming to speak from God, uh, uh, this man who's challenging the elders, this man who's teaching with uh, uh, authority, what in the world would he be doing? Why would he intentionally go outside the confines of Israel and, and be in this area? You know, some Jews outside of the area, they actually traveled around this area to get to where they needed to go instead of going through it. But yet Christ himself went into that area and stayed in some house. And we don't know whose house it is, by the way, but he stayed in someone's house there, uh, probably looking for some rest uh, and to teach his disciples. You know, Mark is not explicit about that, but uh, he entered a house and he wanted no one to know it. So he wanted some, some privacy. That's what it... It tells us in verse uh, 34, uh, but 24, but again, of course, that didn't happen, yet he could not escape notice. But it's interesting, the indication that we get is not that he got a throng of people that came to him, not as we saw when he's in Jewish territories, but there was one lady that did come to him, as it says to us, but hearing of him, Excuse me, but after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. And she kept at, now the woman was of a was a Gentile of the Seraphonician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. So that's down to verse 26. And now, now catch this. It, it started it started out by saying in verse 25, uh, whose little daughter had an unclean spirit. And the key word there that I want you all to see is the word unclean. Because you can say demon, you can say unclean spirit. Though both these terms are found in Mark, but it specifically starts out as an unclean spirit. Why? Remember, the prior section that we looked at two weeks ago. The issue came up of eating food, you know, that was, uh, you know, eating food with unwashed hands, you know, you know, you know, dealing with the issue of clean versus unclean food, you know, and and so now we have an unclean spirit. Let let's uh, I I, I want to paint the the connection uh, to you all uh, that that issue dealt with uncleanliness or uncleanliness, uncleanliness in some way, now we have an uncleanliness here. Um, but he goes and, you know, we, we don't know much about this mother. Uh, Mark doesn't tell us. Uh, from outside sources, we know that, you know, she would be a pa pagan, so she's not a follower of Yahweh. You know, she speaks Greek. Um, <coughs> she's wealthier. This was, this was a a wealthier part of town that she was coming from. That's that's what we know. And she comes to Christ and she's repeatedly begging him to deliver her demon-possessed daughter. You know, Matthew, the way Matthew phrases it, the parallel passage in Matthew is Matthew 15, 21 and 28. And Matthew describes her yelling, shouting, you know, as, as you know, she's following Jesus as, as they're walking. You know, Lord, uh, you know, you know, have mercy, heal my daughter. And when I, she, she, she's being persistent. You know, and, and even here, Mark is telling us that, you know, she's, you know, asking, she kept asking him to, 
deliver her daughter, to help her daughter, to cast the demon out of her daughter. Um, and Christ gives a very sort of interesting response. Uh, I'm going to add verse 27, and then we're going to spend some time talking about this. In verse 27, he says, And he was saying to her, Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, Mark, according to Mark, our Lord and Savior said to this woman who was seeking his help, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And he had her, he was talking to her and about her when he said it. Now, we gotta ask ourselves a question here uh, because you, know, you all are relatively calm, but it, it might not shock you to learn that in some quarters, this is a controversial passage because Jesus has called her a dog. And, you know, so, you know, and, and in fact, one. No, it's not that, but that's, that's, that's not a, that's not a, a, a bad, a bad guess. It's, it, it, it's actually, it's actually much deeper than that, but. I, I want to spend some time on it because it's, honestly, I've heard some incredible things about this passage. One, uh, gay, quote-unquote, pastor, theologian, he he described this issue when he was talking about this issue on TikTok, and I don't have TikTok, but I, 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 I heard, I saw the video, but he talks about Jesus, uh, this woman speaking truth to power, you know, and... and uh, when the woman responds, this uh, we're going to see the woman's response in a moment. But you know, Jesus having to repent of his racism and his bigotry, I, I and, and whatnot, and of course that we we see that there's an immediate sort of problem there because if though these things are sin, and if Jesus committed sin while he was on the earth, he could not be our sinless savior. You know, we you know we still be dead in our sins. Uh, you know, and, and from others, uh, you know, for others, as I was sort of studying this, you know, you, you see these attempts to sort of soften it, you know, uh, or to make it sort of less potentially offensive. But, you know, he called her a dog. And so we need to ask, what, what did he mean um, by calling her a dog? Was he being insulting? You know, was he guilty of speaking out of prejudice and hint no um, what what what's going on here well a couple of things that we can sort of look at here uh, the word that dog in our text in, in our Bibles uh, there are two Greek words that are used to translate the word dog I don't have the second one but the first one is uh, carry on I, I know I'm butchering that but this word refers to like a house dog or a little puppy dog. Um, the, the second word that's not used here, it's used in other parts of the Bible, but it's not used here, uh, refers to like a, a, you know, a, a street dog, a, a savage dog, a scavenger dog too. The more, ne it has the more negative type of connotation uh, to it. Uh, and so just on that alone, you might say, well, okay, he, he wasn't really trying to demean her uh, too much, you know. It, you know, we, you, you might think about it as a, a, a as an animal. You know, we have dogs as pets. There, you know, there's three of them in there. Uh, but still, I, I don't think anyone here, if they were called, you know, someone referred to you, oh, that's a nice, you know, that's that's a nice dog. That person is a nice dog. <laughs> Would see that as a compliment. Uh, you, you, you'd probably be insulted. So. Uh, we can't really stop there. Now, here's the thing. Dogs were not viewed positively in scripture. And not in the sort of the broader, I'm not talking about the broader world right now, but they weren't, they're not 
used positively, or the term is not used positively in scripture. So uh, as I was studying this, what I think I found is amongst the Jews, dogs were declared unclean and regarded with contempt. Uh, what did Samuel, not Samuel, what did Goliath say when David, David came out to him? You know, in 1 Samuel 17, 43, he says, Am I a dog that you cometh to me with slaves? This is an older book, so I was quoting the King James. Uh, uh, is thy servant a dog that he should do this thing? That's 2 Kings 8, 13. A, a, a living dog is better than a dead lion. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9, 4. Uh, th these are not positive references. Uh, yet there were some places where dogs were domestic domesticated, they were tolerated around houses, you know, you know, but only if they could be used for scavengers. Did they they weren't they didn't have the type of relationship that we had with dogs sort of today. Um, at least at least the Jews uh, didn't. Um, in addition to that, we do have to look at uh, now. Now it's a different word in the New Testament, but you know, Paul is not shy of uh, not shy about calling people dogs. You know, in Philippians three two, he says, "Beware of the dogs, beware of the evildoers, beware of the false circumcision." Peter, in Second Peter two twenty two, it ha it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returned to its own vomit. And a soul after washing returns to wall to wallowing in the mire. So I could keep going. You, you, you sort of get the point. Um, now, of course, if this is what if these are the type of things Jesus had in mind, again, this would be sort of problematic. Um, however, this was not the view outside of Jewish circles. Dogs were more positively viewed outside of Jewish circles. Um, in fact, in well-to-do households that, you know, were influenced by Greek custom or culture, you know, dogs were sometimes pets. And so I want to submit to you that uh, Jesus is approached speaking with this woman, speaking to this woman in her context. He doesn't have on the mind the, the Jewish uh you know, disparaging use of the term dog uh, in regards to uh, Gentiles, but, you know, the term as she would understand it. That's why he, he the, the Greek word that he uses is even refers to like a little dog or a, a puppy dog, you know, something that could be uh, thought of as a pet. Let's see if I missed something. No. That's it. Okay, so that's that's the first uh, part of it. Now, there's a second thing here that I want us to uh, consider uh, before we sort of move on to um, you know the the rest of the interaction, and that is, I think that there was I, I think a case can be made that there was something else going on here in terms of the the context of which Jesus is interacting with this. Um, Seraphonician woman. There are there were sort of economic issues at play. So, you know, we this, Mark doesn't reference this, but we we learn from Acts. Acts twelve twenty is the reference that you know King Herod Agrippa, who would come after you know after Christ, he um, he supplied food to these regions to Tyre and Sidon, where these where this woman is from. Um, and it, it turns out that much of the produce, much of the, I guess, the, the fruit and vegetables, the, you know, the agriculture that was produced in Galilee, a lot of it likely ended up in Tyra. And so you had a situation where, you know, Jewish peasants were farming, they were putting, you know, they were working hard to, to grow this food and it being sold to a Gentile territory and you know, therefore leaving, you know, the native Jews without potentially or, or in lack. Um, and and for, uh, also there were issues of exploitation. So, you know, the, she came from a class of people that regularly sort of exploited the labor of Syrians and some Jewish settlers. So, you know, 
as one commentator put it, the woman belongs to a group that in a sense had been taking over children's bread, so to speak. So uh, I, again, I, I'm laying out all of this because this is, you know, this is the world that Jesus is speaking into. And I think this is, this is the environment that we wanna, you know, we wanna look at uh, this term. So again, let the children be satisfied first. That's the other thing that we need to see. Let the children, notice what he said, let the children be satisfied first. So that's not a permanent no, you know, in, in answer to her request. It's, you know, uh, hold on a second, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Uh, so I want to submit to you to sort of sum up everything I've been saying is that he wasn't speaking out of prejudice, rather he was speaking to her and, and drawing on her cultural reality, her, the, the, her economic reality, uh, to try and provoke a response out of her. Uh, I, I wanna submit to you all that, and I'm gonna show this in a moment, that he was drawing out faith from her. You see, she would have come to an area from an area where they had these magicians, you know, that you know, you, you could, if you said the right words, you said things over and over, you could probably get them to do what you want, but you know, but that wasn't going to work here. Uh, so he, he's he, he's bringing out from her a persistent faith uh, that you know was not going to be denied, frankly, um, even while its needs were unmet. Uh, and that's why that's why I draw attention to the word first. Uh, and as support for that conclusion, let me cite what Paul says. Paul in Romans 1, 16 to 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Uh, So uh, Jesus is saying, hey, uh, he, at least right now he's saying, hey, listen, I, I have a speci I, I do have, I did come with a specific mission. Uh, he's not rejecting her, but he's saying, I came from a specific mission. And also, you know, we don't hear from the disciples all here, but I, I want to, they're, they're in the background sort of watching. And Matthew's gospel, and Matthew's telling of this account, they, we do hear from them. They, they ask Christ, can you just send her away? Uh, can you can, uh, can you silence her? You know, because she's annoying us by, you know, following us and asking you to heal her daughter. Uh, and that's why I also want to submit to you that this is an object lesson. He's also trying to teach his disciples something in this, uh, and we're about to see what that is. Uh, so I, I went through all of that, but listen to her response in verse twenty-eight. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. Think about that for a second. She literally just called a dog, you know, and her response is, yes, Lord. Lord, I, I, I am going to take as a given, I am going to accept as true what you have said I am. Uh, and I'm still pressing forward. Uh, notice in that response, and it's the same response in Matthew, notice in that response, she doesn't speak as if she felt insulted. She doesn't lash out or you know, speak truth to power, you know, she accepted her status as defined by Jesus. He, she agrees with Christ as to who she is. You know, and one thing, I, I, let me stop here and make this point. This is a humility that is vital to true discipleship. And that is, you know, understanding, you know, who and, and acknowledging and accepting who God says we are. Not who we want to be or not who we claim to be ourselves. Uh, it's, 
It's understanding that his verdict is final. Uh, and if we're going to follow him, we have to accept that. We have to be willing. We have to put aside all pride or all arrogance. And, you know, we cannot be puffed up. You know, Lord, what you say is true. And, and that is the basis of how I must deal with you. Uh, notice something else here. So we, we, we see this humility. Uh, and again, she, she acknowledges that, you know, she's not entitled to receive anything. You know, so yes, Lord, it, 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 it's true. I, I'm not a child. You know, I, 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 I'm not, you know, I'm not of the household of Israel. She, she accepts the, prior, the preeminence of Israel in, in that regard. She, she got his point. Uh, and she says, yes, Lord. Um, uh, by the way, because in, in Matthew's account of this, he says to the disciples, I'm not sent but to the house of, uh, of Israel. You know, she, she acknowledges his point, but she doesn't give up. Uh, and let, let, let me point something out to you that, that's actually interesting. When I, as I, I missed this point myself, but as I was studying this, was pointed out to me. I'm like, huh, she actually does better, believe it or not. In this, in her response, she does better than the apostles. In other words, she exceeds where the apostles had failed up until this point. What do I mean by that? When we looked at the second coming of the storm, right? When they're, they're in the middle and they're rowing hard and Jesus is coming walking on the water. Remember, Mark tells us that, you know, he, he gets into the boat and the storm stops. But, you know, he, he tells us in Mark chapter 6 that they don't get it. Uh, it uh, verse is 51 and 52 of Mark 6. That he got into the boat with them and the wind stopped and they were utterly astonished. For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. So, you know, they, you know they, they're, they're failing to sort of the sea, but yet she understood uh, what Jesus was trying to say, and she actually carries his statement to the logical conclusion. Uh, no, uh, doesn't, no, you're right. The master and the father, he doesn't take the children's food and feeds it to the dogs. But that doesn't mean the dogs go hungry. Think about what she's saying. They get the scraps in real time as the children are eating and they're messy and things fall off the table. You know, the, the dogs go and wrap it up. Things that like that really do happen, by the way. And not that I'm a messy eater, but if something drops, two of my three dogs are usually under the table. And I've got to be careful because one of them can't have just a, any, anything he wants, but they'll go and get it if I'm not quick enough. Yeah. <laughs> so that they can, yum, 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 yum. Hey, that, that's good, give me some more. Uh, uh, but she, she makes the point, look, they get distracted in real time, receiving something for themselves. Um, and, and it's fascinating, this is a fascinating. She, and making this point, She's actually saying that the blessings that are given to the children can end up benefiting the pets without taking anything away. And you know, I, in, in my Bible, I have here, I, I handwrit a note uh, in reference to Genesis 12 and three, because what does Genesis 12 and three say? It, it talks about th that through thy seed, all the nations of the earth are gonna be blessed. All the nations are gonna be uh, blessed through God's working and operating uh, through Israel. Uh, and that's exactly what is happening here. Uh, and, 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 and the thing that's it, it, amazing about this, and all of this, she, notice she never doubts Christ's ability to do what she's asking. <clears throat> so we've got humility here. We, we, we've got agreement with what God says about who she is, and you know, and, and we have a a, determ a real, determined, persistent faith. This is what Christ wanted. This is why he called her a dog. This is what he was doing. He was not trying to demean or be insult insulting. He was drawing out of her uh, what was what was needed. And and I gotta imagine the apostles probably are watching this and like, what in the world is going on here? Uh, in fact, in Matthew's account, it, it says, oh, 
oh, oh, how, woman, how great is your faith. <clears throat> uh, and, and she's healed. He, he grants her request. Verse 29, and he said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. Praise the Lord. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed. The demon having left. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's interesting there. Uh, he, he just speaks the word and it happens. I was rem this reminds me of the story with the centurion's servant. You know, he, you know, the centurion in Matthew goes to meet Christ and Christ says, I'll come. But listen, the centurion says, no, 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 Lord. I'm not worthy for you to have you step in my home. Listen, I'm a man of authority. I speak. And it happens. I tell somebody to go here and they go. And all you got to do is speak the word and it will be. Uh, that, that came to mind. We, we see here again the authority of Jesus. You know, God merely, Jesus uh, merely spoke the word from a distance and deliverance occurred. They, if you really think about that, it was really never necessary for Christ to be physically present somewhere. Uh, for his power to manifest. Uh, what was necessary was for those approaching him to believe. Uh, this is why we can really have hope today. Christ, is not, Christ has not been physically present on the earth and, uh, since he ascended up into heaven. But he is here by the spirit. He dwells in all of our hearts. He goes everywhere, and his word is just as efficacious now as it was then. Uh, let me sort of sum this up and draw, draw, draw it all together. Uh, let, let me start with this. Uh, I, I titled this The Kind of Faith That Saves, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. But, um, but let me uh, start it this way. Um, her, Christ's statement about the children, that whole interaction about the children's bread um, and how she responds to it, it, it does highlight an important truth about salvation. So this actually ties into the kind of faith that saves, um, that salvation, the salvation of God or salvation uh, comes really only by grace through faith. You know, it, it never was a matter of ethnicity, but of the heart. So yes, we know that God had a, gave his special revelation to Israel. He had a covenant uh, with uh, Israel that he did not have with the rest of the nations. But if you read the Old Testament, you know that merely being a part of ethnic Israel wasn't enough. You had to actually believe this word. You had to actually believe this law of Moses. Uh, but also, I think evidence can be found in the fact that within the law itself, it says that the, this law will, the same laws will apply to both the native and the stranger. From the beginning, there was a doorway for those out, for those who were not Israelites uh, to serve the living God, to be accounted as a part of the people of God. You know, that, that stranger that said, okay, uh, that stranger could offer sacrifices uh, to Yahweh. We, we, we see that in, in the law. They had to follow the same rules, but they could offer uh, sacrifices. Well, they wouldn't do that unless they, you know, believe that this God who was who he said it was. They could be circumcised and cut fully under the covenant. You know, they could come that way. Now, they would only do that if, they're, if they were convicted that, okay, I'm willing to serve this God and this God alone. Uh, you know, they, that would require, that required not for them to literally change their ethnicity. It required them to believe it required faith on their heart. The, the greatest examples of this, maybe not the greatest, uh, but the, some clear examples of this that we see would be both in Rahab and the book of Joshua and Ruth. Rahab believed God. She hid the spies. Hebrews talks about, you know, she, she believed God and she hid the spies because she believed God's word. Ruth said to Naomi, listen, your people are going to be my people. Your God will be my God. Yahweh never excluded the non-Israelite from approaching him. Remember, when Israel came out of Egypt, it wasn't just Israelites that came out of Egypt. It says, Exodus says, a mixed multitude came out. Um, the issue was having the right kind of faith. 
the kind of faith that saves. What did this mother have? No, no, uh, again, this, you know, this is here because I, I in the text because I, we're supposed to learn something from it. Look, what do we see here? She didn't approach Christ in arrogance, but in abasement. You know, you know, if this was a woman of affluence from an upper part, she's she's uh, she's going out to this man, yelling and screaming and pleading, having mercy. She, have mercy on, on my daughter, you know, she's right, not acting the most sort of dignified. That, that's not her concern uh, right now. She wasn't above pleading with Christ for help. She had a need, and he was the only one who could meet that need. So again, we, we see this humility. Uh, notice she, when she, she didn't approach Christ thinking, hey, look, you, do you know who I am? You, you, you need to give me this. No, she you know, she knew she did, she deserved nothing and couldn't demand anything. When we come to Christ, you know, you know we can't come as if, you know, he, he's doing us a favor. We come, we, we, we're supposed to be like the publican, the tack of the Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. You know, Christ said, I, he wouldn't so much as Look up, but held his face down and smote his breast. He, he hit his breast. Um, you know, it, this is the kind of faith. It's, it's the kind of faith that sees one's great needs and the greater one who's able to meet that need. Um, it's the kind of faith, and she recognizes that the grace and mercy of God is was her only hope and is one's only hope. By the way, uh, another interesting thing about this, I didn't point this out earlier, in, in responding to Christ, she says, yes, Lord. This is actually the only time that the word Lord is used, this uh, it appears in Mark and is used this way. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's fascinating. Now the word, it, it could have just had meant sir. It's, it's, it's possible that, that it can be used that way, at least at that time, but, uh, I want to submit to you that she recognized something that the, the disciples were, were didn't fully get that this man was, you know, unlike you know anyone else that had walked that was walking the earth at that time. Uh, no, this is the kind of faith that saves the soul. Uh, to quote my good friend Charles Spurgeon, uh, he. Uh, he says this, this is a faith that, quote, agrees with the mind of God, even if it seemed adverse to herself. The faith that believes the revealed declarations of God, whether they appear to be pleasant or terrible. The faith that assents to God's word, whether it is like a balm to its wound or a sword to cut and slay, end quote. This is the kind of faith that every genuine believer that uh, must have. And this is the type of faith that we come to Christ with in repentance and the type of faith that's really necessary through the rest of our lives. You know, a faith that understands that every single day what we're seeing is the grace and mercy of God. Every single day that every good thing that we receive from him is because of his grace, not because we earned anything. From him. Uh, the kind of faith that is, you know, that, that reaches out and grabs hold and knows that we are totally dependent on him. Uh, that we that we need him. <clears throat> so so we have a, a humility. If there were if there are key words that we could use, we have humility, we have agreement with God's word. Uh, about what God's word says who we are. Uh, and we have belief in the one God sent. I believe you are able to do what you have said that you could do. Um, this is the kind of faith that saves. This is why Jesus went into the Gentile reason to seek rest. And, and again, I can imagine the disciples being shocked or surprised at this ensuing dis discussion. Um, but Jesus, again, he's making the, a point. Uh, he, he needed to uh, make a point. Just as he was, had declared that eating food with unwashed hands didn't defile 
you know, interacting with Gentiles, getting defiled. You know, it, you know, the defilement comes from within. You know, he was interacting with her without fear or concern. Uh, he's also saying that, listen, uh, they are, they are going to need to hear this message too. Uh, I, I want them to. And, and if by way of application for us, that means, you know, everyone needs to hear the gospel. You know, we, we don't want to, we can't and don't want to decide uh, and we shouldn't be deciding who deserves to get the gospel and who shouldn't. In Acts chapter 10, Peter says, you know, when Cornelius, when he finally meets with Cornelius and Cornelius tells him about the, the dream that he had, you know, uh, and being, being told to send for Peter, Peter's like, okay, now I know, okay, now, now, now I know that the Lord doesn't refuse Gentiles, you know, that, you know, that, that all who come to him in, in, in faith, believing, you know, he, you know, he desires all of them. Um, so we, uh, we today need, you know, need to continue to go everywhere, uh, to preach, uh, the gospel, to declare the word of God. And he does the works and he will bring up the kind of faith, uh, that saves souls. Uh, uh and, uh, that's. I'm going to stop there. That's all I have for you on this evening. Brother, yes. All came to my mind when you were talking about the dogs. See, my Bible says little dogs. Okay. Mm -hmm. The thought came when when uh, I read that this in my Bible. Little dogs in Spanish is perritos. Mm -hmm. Okay. When I was about sixteen or seventeen, somewhere around there, I had a friend, best friend who nicknamed me Perrito, you know? Even when he would write me a letter, he would write in parentheses, Perrito, you know, on the, on the little, envelope. Little dog. little dog. Yeah, little dog, you know? And, uh, but the, really the main thing that comes to my mind is not what you say, it's how you say it. Mm -hmm. This guy, there was like a, a pet name for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Perrito, he would always call me Perrito, you know? And I thought it was, I mean, I thought it was funny, you know, I, I never took it wrong, you know, so <clears throat> uh, I guess it's not what you say is how you say it. That's probably, probably why this lady wasn't insulted, right, the way Jesus said it to her maybe. Right, and, you know, she probably, you know, she probably caught, because since there are two different terms that could be used for dog, she, she probably caught... Um, that you know his use of the term that he used, you know that he was you know he was doing something he he had an intent in doing that that he wasn't trying to brush her off automatically. Um, certainly, uh, he you know it, it might have been a little different. We we never know if, if he had sort of used the same type of language that Paul and Peter will use later. You know, and you know they're they're much harsher and intentionally so because they're dealing with like false teachers and, and whatnot. Uh, but but no, he uh, he 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 does he didn't have it in his mind sort of the uh, more sort of insulting type of derogatory uh, usage that you would see. Uh, again he was uh, he was he, he he this was very intentional on his part. He very clearly used that uh, for a very specific purpose and you know, for her, bless the Lord, she got the point and responded appropriately. I, you always, you, you'll hear me talk sometimes on, on Sunday, even on Bible studies about the correct, responding correctly to the word of God. So that's exactly what she did. You know, that, that right, Jesus you, said it was right. Yes. No matter what he said, how he, how he said it, you know. Yes, and that's, that, 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 that's an excellent sort of paraphrase, a, a, a phraseology of uh, uh, one of the points that, that I made. Whatever God says is right. Exactly. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Some of the problems that we, we, we have today is because there are those who believe that what God has said is not right. Um, like I, I used the example earlier of, and that the guy I mentioned is not the only one to have done this, you know, with this particular passage of scripture, you know, to, to say, oh, this is prejudice, this is racism, this is this, this all type of thing, you know, this, you know, this, 
you know, and of course they're diminishing, you know, what they're denying sort of the deity of Christ and whatnot and the sinness of Christ and whatnot. But, but yeah, we have to agree with God because he's God and he's going to be right, you know, in, in regards to whatever he says, whether it's something positive or it's something negative, to, to go back to the Spurgeon quote, because he's God. Right. Amen. So. Praise the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. If all hearts and minds are clear, we will be, uh, we'll, we'll close out there. Uh, now you want to get brighter for me. Father, we thank you, God, for who you are, for what you've done. Father, we thank you for your word, O God, Father. We thank you, O God, that you have given to us, O God, the kind of faith that saves, O God. And you have reminded us, O God, of its general working, O God, and, and the elements, O God, uh, that it contains. Father, write these words upon the tablets of our hearts, O God. Always, O God, help us always, O God, to approach you, God, in humility, O God, in agreement with your word, O God. And, and truly believing that you are able to do all that uh, you have said that you can do. Uh, Father, keep us throughout this week, O oh God, from hurt, harm, and danger, O oh God, the rest of this week, O oh God, go with us and before us, O oh God, uh, keeping us round about on every side, O oh God, bringing us back at the next appointed time. Father, I pray for safe travel and mercies, O oh God, uh, for everyone, O oh God, here, O oh God, that you take them to their homes quickly and safely, O oh God, and, O oh God, and that your blessing will rest, rule, and abide, O oh God, in the homes with them, O oh God, as they say. Father, we thank you. We ask these mighty blessings. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.